In mid-November, the State Assembly held a hearing on the funding and policies in the current state budget intended to impact the agriculture industry in New York. The Agriculture Committee, which oversaw the proceeding, was also interested in learning more about the cultivation of specialty and emerging crops in the Empire State. To discuss what was learned from this fact-finding exercise, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Assembly Agriculture Committee Chair Donna Lopardo, a Binghamton area Democrat. Welcome back to the show, Assembly Member. Always good to be here. Thanks. So out of the gate, uh, you were asking the state's uh, agriculture and markets uh, commissioner about the agriculture workforce and specifically spending intended to develop the farm workforce, which is in real demand these days. What, if anything, did you hear from him about how that money is being spent and or its effectiveness in ensuring that farm workers are out there? Well, as you know, sometimes uh, when we put something in the budget the year before, it takes a good year before that gets implemented. And I, I know that the effort is underway to develop a workforce center. Uh, I am very mindful of the fact that, you know, after visiting farms, that we have some real world immediate needs. Um, and that is now being underscored uh, by a potential risk of some of their workers perhaps being inadvertently caught up in some, you know, deportation raids. Uh, so it's it's a difficult time right now to be a farm worker, especially someone who is in from an, from another country. But in general, we have uh, because of the labor costs, we're we're ha- we're suffering from some very serious workforce shortages. So I'm going to have to see how the investments that we've made are are playing out. I do do know that there's an enormous amount of worry right now about how to proceed. Well, yeah. Did you feel like Commissioner Ball provided any great level of depth onto? how spending is going to this date? Well, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to co- the commissioner uh, because we do hand him a lot of initiatives and, and a lot of, uh, you know, to-go planning. And uh, so, you know, we, I'm very comfortable with the fact that he mm-hmm. gets the dilemma we are finding ourselves in, ever more complicated by the changing circumstances in, in, uh, in Washington. Well, in light of you bringing up uh, the potential changes to immigration policy at the federal level, what, if anything, are you bracing for? And is there reason to believe this could have a meaningful impact on the state's agriculture industry if we're led to believe the workforce that farmers rely on are documented and are you know legally employable? We've been worried about this for a very long time to start with. <laughs> Uh, before this particular change took place, uh, without a legal path to citizenship, we are really ignoring a huge swath of individuals who want to come to this country and to be here legally and to participate in the type of farm work that most people in our state do not want to engage in. So we've already been at the edge. Once we put in place overtime standards that require overtime over a certain number of hours, by the nature of the Uh, margins that farmers are facing, they have already decided to just cap work at 60 hours. It's a very extreme circumstance where they're going to go over that. So we're already seeing farmers uh, who are coming from other countries as part of the H-2A program electing to go to other states, which is, so we've already begun to undermine the number of farmers who are coming because of this cap that we have, the farmers have placed on, on on their workers because of the overtime. I mean, of course, we want people to get overtime, but a lot of people, especially seasonal workers, want to work many, many hours to go back home for free resources to their family. So we're already starting out the gate with uh, concerns about our workers, the lack of of an immigration path to citizenship, and now we have the threat of potential raids. Do we know how many people are on our farms who are not part of a program, who have gotten here illegally? No, we do not. I can tell you, however, we are relying on these folks and we're going to have to get a handle on who they are and what we can do to help protect them. This is going to get complicated, obviously. Well, given the role that the federal government plays in immigration, what, if anything, can the state do other than be an observer to the whims of the Trump administration? That is unclear to me at the moment. I'm sure that my colleagues are going to have any number of ideas on how to provide some type of protection for these folks that we rely on. But that's one of uh, a, 
one of the topics that I'm very much looking forward to having when we get back into uh, into conference and into, into our, our next legislative session. This is a very big worry, and it's a worry across a number of disciplines, not just in agriculture, but in hospitality and in our you know, landscaping and many, many fields where workers are in short supply, not because we are short of people, it's because people don't want to do that type of work anymore. Well, you referred earlier to the overtime threshold in New York, which was uh, lowered to 60 hours a week and is now gradually moving to 40 hours a week. Uh, what did you hear as part of this conversation about the implementation of the tax credit that is intended to cover those overtime costs up to 60 hours a week? Well, I have mixed feelings on this. I was certainly very supportive and one of the folks suggesting that the state make up the difference. Because right now, I think we're making up the difference between 57 and a half hours and 60. Mm-hmm. We heard that applying for the credit is complicated. We heard that they wish it were more than just, I think it's twice a year. I think in general, we heard a lot of worry about how long this could be sustained. Um, Again, even though I supported it, I worry that it will not be sustainable when we get to 40 hours. It will just take a change in administration or a change of heart on the part of the legislature, a budget shortfall, and that's all gonna fall away. It's just an odd way to keep things going. When uh, if my colleagues who supported this in the first place had understood that farm work is very, very different than other types of work, it is seasonal, it is complicated, and it is dependent on people who, by and large, come here from out of country to help make a better life for their families back home. So it's um, it's it's definitely a dilemma all the way around. That argument, though, about the unique nature of agriculture, I think, sits pretty poorly with a lot of employers around the state who have to figure out how to manage their costs and have limited ability to change their revenues. And I think about reporters, for example, who, you know, uh, have employers who don't want to offer them overtime. But, you know, the news, much like dairy production, is not a five days a week, 24, uh, nine to five uh, job. So why shouldn't we be playing the world's smallest violin for these business owners. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to take you on straight away on this world's smallest violin comment. Um, but I, I have to tell you that because of weather factors alone, if you just look at that, where some farm workers may be sidelined for days at a time because the weather does not allow them to to get out in the fields, then all of a sudden there's the, the work is on and they're having to uh, you know, take on many, many hours. That one item, item right there does not affect reporters with all due respect. If, if an announcement comes at nine o'clock at night, we have to cover it and we have to work beyond 40 hours a week and they can't charge extra money for the newspaper that week. They have fixed costs. So there's no overtime credit for the newspaper industry or any other uh, business that I'm aware of. The agriculture industry is completely unique and they complain about the fact they have to do paperwork at all. That was what the head of the Farm Bureau said to us. You know, farmers don't like doing paperwork. I mean, I again, bring up maybe not the smallest violin. How about the smallest viola in the world? I hear you. I, I, I'm not, we don't need to get into an argument about it, but I, I can tell you this, that for many of our dairy farmers in particular, they. They cannot set their price. So they are very, very uh, fixed in in what type of margins they can make when they don't set the price for their Mm -hmm. their milk, for example. So that that is one wrinkle in addition to uh, the, the enormous weather challenges that they're facing. But your point is well taken. So another topic that came up during this hearing was the future of hemp in New York, and specifically for hemp that's not necessarily going to be used to make, say, CBD products, but other uses. What is the challenge there? And I guess, what are the opportunities that you're looking to tap into? Well, to be honest with you, when we first legalized the production of of industrial hemp, uh, I was a little surprised that so many farmers decided to grow the riskier uh, varietal, which produces CBD. I understand why they did it. But uh, unfortunately, the market collapsed because of overproduction and uh, contaminated products that came in from out of country in particular. Uh, we have a trust factor, uh, obviously, to, to contend with with our hemp farmers. Not only did they lose money on the CBD collapse, they also lost money when they were given the first right to grow uh, for 
the uh, adult use cannabis industry. So many of them were financially ruined in the middle of this. Um, we are um, optimistic that uh, working on hemp fiber, for example, for the construction industry in, in particular, has an opportunity for, uh, it, so long as farmers can be guaranteed that there will be an outlet for their, for what their, for their crops, uh, that will, will be put to good use in the construction fields in particular with hempcrete, hemp bricks, um, certain types of wood products, siding, and, and, and at RPI, which is uh, trying to put together a center for excellence in something called Feed to City, uh, mm -hmm. they have invented a, a hemp rebar that does not rust, which has the opportunity to revolutionize um, the way uh, buildings, the way flood walls are put together, the way parking garages are constructed, wherever rebar is, is made, uh, they can use an industrial hemp product uh, in a brand new uh, rebar that would be an amazing development. But uh, we're very excited. The construction industry is excited about it. And we're also pleased to, to report that Pratt Institute is now a partner along with Cornell and Morrisville and others because as they train the next generation of architects, they have pointed out to us that architects uh, spec projects. And if they are more involved with uh, this type of uh, material, they will be more inclined to spec it into their pro into their jobs. So we're we're um, you know going full steam ahead. Lots of conversations with the governor's office and budget about looking at a coordinated development of the hemp fiber industry. Um, of course, we also have hemp that's grown for seed for food, and some people who are still growing hemp for CBD, which is uh, which is still popular and but certainly not mm -hmm. at the scale that we initially uh, grew. Well, it seemed like a lot of the regulations that were put into place when the hemp boom happened here in New York were focused on the idea of hemp being used for those CBD products. Does there need to be a new regulatory structure for hemp that's used for those other alternatives? Well, yeah, we are very much hoping that uh, that the federal government will ease up on the the dramatic restrictions that they have on hemp farmers, mm -hmm. because there's no, there's nothing in industrial hemp. It's, a, it's something to be used for construction materials, for example, uh, that has some sort of psychoactive effect on anyone in particular. Uh, we're actually now getting some somewhere on using hemp seed for animal feed. Uh, the federal government has allowed that, but hemp farmers need a federal background check and expenses, expensive licensure and fees. So we were appealing to the federal government to try to lighten up on that uh, so that our, we can actually have our hemp farmers uh, you know, do better at this. Uh, but we can't do that at the state level. Believe me, I have tried. I want to turn to an issue that was addressed at the committee hearing that caught me by surprise, which is aquatic sciences and seafood. How did that come up uh, under the jurisdiction of the Agriculture Committee? I oftentimes refer to my committee as the Committee on Agriculture and Food. It helps people understand that this is you know, what we're what we're doing. Uh, we're growing food. We're growing. You know, farmers are not only working on crops and and ranching; they're also working on seafood. And the governor had a blue food initiative as part of the budget last last year, focusing on Long Island seafood, seafood trail, and helping increase the ability to process fish on Long Island, which was noticeable during COVID that the lack mm -hmm. of processing really hurt the cost. So I thought, well, uh, let's bring seafood, I think probably the first time into an agricultural hearing, because I'm promoting the idea of land-based thin fish production. It's already going on, Hudson Valley and other places, where we can upstate actually look at um, growing fish in an aquaculture farming setting in big tubs I visited uh, one of these places already, and it's a you know way to grow food, aquaculture, <laughs> food, <laughs> aquaculture, aquaculture farming. I think is what it's called. So yeah, I was I was excited to to hear from the folks on Long Island what they have planned, how the resources that were budgeted last year will benefit uh, their ability to process. Uh, they still need a lot more, and we will run into the same concerns upstate. We stand up the land-based thin fish industry. We're going to need processing, water permits. It's, a, it's complicated. I just wanted to make sure we got that on the page, that it's not just about downstate, 
that upstate has a stake in uh, in aquaculture as well. Well, you bring up processing, and we hear occasionally about the opportunities and challenges as well in standing up, say, a milk processing business in upstate New York or uh, a meat processing. Do you see New York potentially having more opportunities in processing food products in general, or does it only come with, say, major economic development incentives like we saw with, you know, Fair Life? I don't think we're going to have much choice but to pursue more processing. We are dramatically behind in terms of meat processing. If we go down this fish route, we're going to need to do that. Mm-hmm. Certainly, I continue to hear from milk, from dairy uh, farmers, uh, that they need more processing. We're doing the best we can, but we need a lot more. So as people are looking to New York State as an agricultural bounty with fresh water and, and clean air, believe it or not, people are coming to New York from places that are no longer ha- hospitable to farming, looking for good quality soil and the opportunity uh, to grow. So I do think uh, we're going to see more of that. And I have no problem trying to incentivize that as well. Meat processing in particular is labor intensive. So are you concerned at all that these industries may have the same challenges in finding the workforce as other parts of the agriculture industry? Yeah, meat processing is difficult to recruit people, of course. Uh, More difficult is citing meat processing facilities Mm -hmm. in communities. There's a natural resistance to uh, to to citing these these places obviously Um, but it can be done and there are communities that are are welcoming if we can put the resources behind it we have put in uh, uh, some some substantial resources to promote meat processing on the last few budgets and we are going to continue to monitor that and do the best we can but yeah i see i see new york as a as a great agricultural opportunity i remain frustrated however uh, when it comes to prime prime farmland. I uh, cannot come to a resolve on how in the middle of our solar uh, expansion that we can protect our prime farmland. Um, It's just one of these ongoing um, uh, conversations that I cannot come to a resolve on. We have two competing ideas going on at the same time. We have farmers who reserve the right as they should to do what they need to do with their land. But on the other hand, we can't afford to lose any more of that farmland to uh, to our solar industry. So I'm trying to come up with some kind of balance, some type of incentive, something we can do. As I'm worried, I mean, New York, uh, you know, the Comptroller's report just came out. We lost 14% of our farms and 9% of our farmland just in the last 10 years. And then, of course, in the last five, we lost 40% of the state's dairy farms, small family dairy farms all consolidated into into bigger operations. So in general, I'm worried about the, on the one hand, the future of our current farmers. On the other hand, the interest that's coming to New York is uh, uh, really requiring us to step up and own this uh, bounty and protect it. Well, we've been speaking with Assembly Agriculture Committee Chair Donna Lupardo. She is a Binghamton area Democrat. Assembly member, thank you so much for making the time and good luck in this uh, evolving landscape. Thank you very much. Take care. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capital Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.